And they do look beautiful sitting up. Let's give our honorees a round of applause before we even get started. As we celebrate our fifth Women's History Month, um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lori Lewis. I am the head of strategic alliances and marketing here at Brooklyn Borough Hall. I'm, and I just would like to say this is really amazing for me because this is our fifth um, Women's History Month celebration here at Brooklyn Borough Hall since BP Adams took office. And um, the last four I worked on, and this one I didn't really have to do much work, but then Michelle asked me to speak, so <laughs> it puts me in a different position. Um, what I would like to do is, before we get started, one thing we always ask, how many of you, this is, is this your first time at Brooklyn Borough Hall? Ready to show of hands? All right. We love seeing new faces. We love seeing all faces. <laughs> But we do love seeing new faces at Borough Hall. So what we decided to do this year before we start with the full program is that we wanted to introduce to you some of the senior women here at Brooklyn Borough Hall and talk a little bit about our roles here in the borough and what we do for our residents. So I'm gonna start. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the head of strategic alliances and marketing. I am actually also the executive director of the Borough President's city-affiliated city nonprofit, which is called the One Brooklyn Fund. And if you haven't seen that, you can get to it from our website. It's onebrooklynfund.org. Um, what my role entails is looking for sponsorship. So for events like this, where we have a lovely dais, we have flowers for our honorees, we have food downstairs, we have to find sponsorship. All these events are done free and open to the public. So what we do is we talk to sponsors. Of course, this event, as you see in your program, was sponsored by Metro Plus, and um, they will speak later this evening. But we have thousands of sponsors who work with us and try to make uh, our programs more fruitful with their sponsorship. So one of the things I enjoy about my job is not only going out and speaking to sponsors, but also hearing what they have to say. And I can tell you that most of the sponsors I talk to always say, you all are doing a lot at Brooklyn Borough Hall. You're getting around. People know you. People see BP Adams. He's everywhere. And that's a good thing. We love hearing it. We are working hard. We're all working hard. And so we do like to hear that people recognize we're doing a good job. So Michelle asked me to speak about the, my role here at Borough Hall. That's what I do. But I also sat back and started to reflect on Women's History Month. Um, I think about all the women at Borough Hall, and we work all hours, weekends, yes. nights, oh yeah, holidays. We are a very, very dedicated group of women. Everybody in the building is dedicated, but the women, we are very, very dedicated. Um, <laughs> and so we're working hard not only for ourselves, the borough, our residents, and our borough president. And so I thought about that, and then I also thought about the next generation of female leaders who made themselves known to us last Saturday at the March for Our Lives rally. So we think about some of these young women who are coming behind us. We heard from Naomi Wadler, who is an Alexandria fifth grader. She made an eloquent speech. She was phenomenal, and she's only 11 years old. We heard from Emma Gonzalez, who was a Parkland, Florida student, and she stood at the microphone for six minutes and 20 seconds, the same amount of time it took for the gunmen to take out her friends. And we heard from Yolanda King, Yolanda Renee King, the nine-year-old granddaughter of Dr. Martin Luther King. She gave a twist to his I Had a Dream speech, and she talked about her dream. So as we stand here, and we're the women of Borough Hall, I think we're in very good hands because the next generation, they have us covered. Thank you. Good evening, sisters. How are you? Now, all of you are going to have to speak a little louder than that. This is Women's History Month. Are there women in the house? Great. And I'm not leaving out the brothers. So we welcome you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ama Jamo, and I'm special counsel to the Brooklyn Borough President. And before I became special counsel, I was a prosecutor here in Brooklyn for 22 years, where I was 
humbly and proudly able to represent victims of child abuse and sexual abuse and assault, women and children, the most vulnerable people sometimes in a given community. And I was able to serve this county with distinction. And now I'm at Borough Hall, where I've been at Borough Hall for the last five years, working with our beloved Borough President, Eric L. Adams. Can I hear that one more time? Thank you, always music to my ears. And here at Borough Hall, you will see that he has appointed a lot of women in charge. And that's a good sign for all of us. And here at Borough Hall, aside from being the special counsel, I'm also chief of compliance, internal compliance of all that we do here at Borough Hall, along with being the EEO officer. So we ensure that we have a safe and fair in a non-hostile work environment. And nowadays, we know how important that is. Now, to borrow something from my colleague, Lori, who I've known for years, and she is just awesome in everything that she does. Honestly, I gotta tell you, every woman here, they're awesome in the work that they do. Because really, thank you, really, we're a reflection of each and every one of you in this audience and in the community. And as Lori discussed, last weekend we were able to hear from so many young women the future of our tomorrow. And the, one of the women that really, young girls that struck me was Naomi, our little 11 year old. And you know what she said? She said, my friends and I might still be 11, but, and we might still be in elementary school, but we know life isn't equal for everyone. That was a deep statement, because at 11, she already knew that. And that's disturbing, but it's a rallying cry for all of us. You see, it would be easy for each and every one of us, especially Naomi, to say, you know, it's just too hard to be a woman today. Because as women, it's hard to turn on the news without seeing issues that we care about, issues dealing with protecting our children, civil rights, equal pay, sexual harassment and assault, we could just sit back and say, what are we going to do? But you know what? Only as women and only as we can do, we know one thing. Women, we are able to turn a month into a year, the year of the woman. That's where we're at right now. When we think about the Women's March on Washington last year, and we think about the Me Too movement, the silence breakers, the March for Our Lives, really? We're at a great place in our, in, our, in our history as women. Women have proven time and time again, when we unite, we rise higher than any institution. That's right, I believe that. Because as women, we have to remember the importance of our sisterhood, because we can do this. You know, my father was from Ghana, West Africa, and in the village, all the women were always together. The women were there when the men were hunting. The women were there raising the children. The women were there when the men were hurt. The women were there to feed the community. The women were there to carry on the spiritual aspects of what cultural, cultural life is for any given tribe. Women have always been the backbone in everything that we do globally. So when we think about tonight, we are actually honoring women who have done extraordinary things to make a difference in the lives of others, especially of those here in Brooklyn. We are honoring women who have immigrated from other countries to find success here in Brooklyn. We, have, we are honoring women who broke the glass ceiling without compromising traditional values and religious beliefs. We are honoring women who have volunteered their time and talent at no cost to the recipient. And we have rallied in their communities together as women under one certain cause, one certain need, and that is doing the best we can in our community. So when I think about these marches and I think about the movements, I keep thinking, what is in store? What is the future for women and girls in the United States and in the world? Well, I'll tell you, it speaks volumes. I want to tell you that each of our honorees for 
I want to thank them, first of all, for their persistence in what they've done for our community. Thank you so much. Can we give them a round of applause? We are honoring you for your impact, not only on Brooklyn, but for a generation of young girls. And your contributions truly will make 2018 the year of the woman. And we, as we move forward in this movement, in this time, as we focus on what we have done as women, let's remember the girls who are in the room, the girls who are in our communities, the girls in our families, let, us, let, let them know that there is nothing that they can't do. We're living proof of it in the lives and all the sacrifices that we've made. It's time, sisters, for us to make room for our young girls because they are our light and they are our future. Can we give a hand applause for all of our young girls? Thank you. And on behalf of the Brooklyn Borough President, I am honored to introduce our number one woman in this office. And she is a woman of distinction. She's not just my sister, she's not just my friend, she's not just my colleague, but she's always been a fighter for justice and community you know, in Brooklyn. And it is, I am proud, we call her Ingrid, and I'm proud to introduce you to our senior advisor, Ingrid Lewis Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, my former student. <laughs> Welcome to Brooklyn Borough Hall. To all of the people who are here for the very first time, it is indeed a pleasure to host you this evening. I am Ingrid P. Lewis Martin. I am the senior advisor to Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams. My role as the senior advisor to the Borough President, first and foremost, is to work extremely closely with him to help him on almost every major decision that is made within this office. I am, as Alma said to you, the most senior member of the administration. In the absence of the borough president, I am actually the acting borough president. So if he doesn't watch himself, I might, you know, bump him off. And <laughs> <laughs> but tonight my role is very simple. My two colleagues did a wonderful job. Alma is always so eloquent. It's very simple. We want to give thanks and praise to our honorees, each and every one of you. You are so deserving for all of the work that you have done in our community. We know that there have been many women whose shoulders we stand upon. If you go downstairs in our community room, there is a portrait of the first black female deputy borough president, Ms. Jeanette Gadsden. And I knew Jeanette Gadsden, and I would say that she was a role model for me. She was one of the many women that I looked at and emulated and wanted to be like. And I know that she has transitioned. She's no longer with us in the physical sense, but she is with us spiritually always. That she's very proud to see that we have our first African-American borough president and that he, yes, please, let's give praise and thanks. And that he, in his infinite wisdom, has a number of women in the highest positions in his administration. And we do not have positions where we just rubber stamp. We have real positions where we sit at the table and we have dialogue and we talk and we engage. I've been doing this work for a number of years, too many, since I was 19, and I have a son that's 32, so that'll just tell you a little something. And as a woman in government, it is very difficult to be at the table as a woman of African descent, it is even more difficult. I was always very adamant that if I'm involved and I'm engaged in a meeting, my voice will be heard. I am blessed because my principal, Eric L. Adams, the president of our borough, he gets it. We started out when he was running for Senate. Our deputy is here. Omar, he's not a woman, but he's my brother and I love you. When the borough president was running for Senate, and he won. He made it clear to everyone that Ingrid is my political partner. She will be at the table and she will be engaged. She will not be marginalized. And to this day, he has that same, same exact energy for which I am very grateful. 
all of my sisters here in Brooklyn Barber Hall get that same respect. When we as women elevate to certain positions, we have to work harder, longer, we have to be the B-I-T-C-H that we really aren't. The only thing that we're doing is what's right and fighting for what we know to be fair and equal, but because we lend our voice and we stand up, then we become the bad guys. So I want to commend all of the women at Brooklyn Barber Hall for all of the hard work that they do. As Arma and, and Lori expressed to you, we have a lot of young women, up and coming women, little girls, up and coming, who we are so proud of that we know will take our place and will take it to the next level. So tonight is our fifth anniversary of Women's History Month, and I am just amazed. Time has just flown by. And it is a special night, especially in the climate in which we are working. It is indeed a pleasure for us to host this event in partnership with our president of the borough and for you to be here. So I'm going to ask all of the women from Brooklyn Borough Hall, if you are here, if you can hear me, please come forward. Arma, Michelle, Michelle, you really need to come forward. Michelle does all of our major events. Come on, sisters in the back. All of the women at Brooklyn Borough Hall, all of the women, if you hear the voice. Tanise, Arma, Michelle, she does all of our major events in this building. She's quiet, humble, she gets it done. This event wouldn't be possible without M Michelle. No, no, I'm, I'm walking down the road. I'm, I'm, I'll do the pictures in a minute. Glenda, she's new on our team, but she's been phenomenal. Christian, who I know from the Senate, I'm just overwhelmed to be honest with you, Christian. And we have a number of women here who are volunteering. With some of our volunteers, please, if you are volunteering in the office, please come forward. I don't know all of their names. Come on, Marcus's mom. All of our volunteers, if you hear it, and there's more. There are people in the hallway. There are a number of women in this office, and we work. We're grinders. We have, we have a principle that we love. We respect, and it's a pleasure to do the work for. So I am not going to talk much longer. I'm going to pose for a picture, and then I'm going to introduce our Star Spangled Banner. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a number of judges who are in the audience with us tonight. With the judges, please stand up. I don't want to forget anyone's name. So they always support our events, Judge Edwards, Judge Hines, Radix, Judge Ash, and Judge Toussaint. So I want to thank you all for coming. We have representatives from our union here. The president, Sean, please, of Local 371. 372, so, you know what it is? I love both of you guys. I get Michelle and Sean, you know, I, and, and, and it's all love. So again, I want to just thank each and every one of you tonight from the bottom of our hearts to be here as we celebrate our women this evening. Each of you are phenomenal. We thank you for what you do for our city, for our borough, for our children. We love you and we wish you praises in abundance. So you are more than welcome, <laughs> okay? So, okay, so without any further ado, we're talking about women, little women who are up and coming. We have a young woman who will sing the Star Spangled Banner for us tonight. Her name is Miss Nia Williams. She comes from, let me get the school right. PS 149, Danny K. He was a Brooklyn Knight. <laughs> Come on, let's show the young sister some love.
Thank you, Nia and companyist. Thank you very much. In order for us to do the various events that we host here at Brooklyn Barber Hall, it requires dollars and cents, sometimes an in-kind contribution. Lori explained to you her role and capacity as the executive director of our acknowledged non-for-profit by the city of New York, known as One Brooklyn. So in order for us to get anything done, money is donated to One Brooklyn or an in-kind contribution is donated to One Brooklyn, or in some cases, the borough president has a small fund that he's able to do events from, but it's very limited. Tonight, we have with us one of our sponsors. We always lean to this particular entity for sponsorship. Metro Plus Health Plan. I just wanted to make sure that I said it properly. They are always, always here. I remember the last event that I participated in, which was African American History Month. They were a sponsor. So we thank them very much. And without any further ado, I will ask Ms. Gail Smith to please come forward. Is Gail here? Okay, so Gail isn't here this evening. But we have her trusty partner in government. I forget your first name. Mr. Ron Law. So we want to give Mr. Ron Law a, a welcome. Um, good evening to everybody. Um, Metro Plus has been a big supporter of the Borough Bar President. And for the last five years, we've also been a supporter of this event as a few other events. I'd like to give my congratulations to the honorees uh, who are receiving their awards for their ex extraordinary commitment. And I must start off, or if, if you will permit me a moment, uh, I would like to start off by saying that I know Martin Luther King is probably smiling down right now because he made the phrase that the arc of moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The justice this year is in the form of hashtag me too, and time is enough. For too long, women have been the subject of abuse, and too long, people have been quiet while they've been abused. And thanks to those two movements, women are now getting their due. I was gonna spend my time standing in for Gail talking about the prominence of women who lived in Brooklyn. I was gonna talk about how the two largest institutions in Brooklyn are run by women. That's the Brooklyn Museum and BAM. And these are institutions that are usually men dominated, but you have two women who run them. I don't know if a lot of you are aware of it, but you also have two editors, one who's for the New York Times Magazine and another one for New Republic. And they live in Brooklyn. And again, they hold positions that are normally held by men. I'm gonna go on talking about women who are from, from Brooklyn in the first in which they've done. And I'm gonna start with uh, Joyce Elders. And a lot of you may remember her. She was the first black woman who was appointed the US Surgeon General under Bill Clinton. You had Elizabeth Holtzman, who was the first woman who was elected the New York City Comptroller, the District Attorney for Brooklyn, and also she represented Congress for four, four years, a, 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 a district in, in Brooklyn for four years. And of course, you can't talk about Brooklyn without talking about Shirley Chisholm. <laughs> Not only was she the Congresswoman for this area, but she also was the first black woman to receive or, or to run for the nomination of her party and the first black woman, or the first woman, period, who ran for, a, who ran for president of the United States. And sticking with the theme of first, Brooklyn has its own Letitia James, who is the public advocate. 
and also the first black woman to run and win a citywide office. And still speaking of first, the first lady of the city of New York, even though she's from Massachusetts, when she's here, she claims Park Slope as a home, when she's not at Gracie uh, Mansion. But there's one woman I really want to speak about, and unfortunately, she's not from Brooklyn, and, and I actually just learned about her this morning, and a lot of you may know who she is. Her name is B Bessie Cole Coleman. She is the first African-American woman, first woman to receive a civilian aviator's pilot license in 1922. Now, I mention her because she has an interesting story, and I, I will admit that I thought I knew a lot about history, but I didn't know anything about her. And I'm sure if some of you aren't, aren't aware of it, you may have bought a stamp and seen, seen her name on that stamp and said, who is this woman? Well, she was born in 19, I'm sorry, in 1892 in Texas. In her youth, she worked as a cotton field with her family. When she was 23, she, she moved to Chicago to live with her brother. And while she was living with, with her brother, um, he happened to make a comment one time to her and he says, you know, I know something that you can never do. She says, what's that? She says, well, when he was in France, French women were able to fly planes and were able to fight and help in the war. He says, that that's something you will never be able to do. Those words alone inspired her to go out to become the first woman, black woman, to get a civilian aviator's license. Well, as you can imagine, in 1919, in the United States, trying to find somebody to teach a woman, let alone a black woman, how to fly was very difficult. Well, she succeeded in a way of getting around that. She went to France. And in France, she learned how to fly. When she came back to the United States with the ability to fly, she realized that there was this new thing called air shows and that you can make a lot of money if you were aviator by joining and participating in the air show. Except for that she realized that in order to be in the air show, she needed a certain skill set which she didn't possess. So she went back to France to get the skills to be able to fly in the air show. Ms. Coleman came back to the United States and on September 3rd, 1922, at Curtis Field in Nassau County, she participated in her first air show and was a success. And for the next four years, she continued to participate and engage in flying as well, and also in occasional parachute jumps. To her credit, Ms. Coleman refused to perform unless the audience was desegregated and everyone who entered the, the show entered through the same gate. Because at times, as you can imagine, there were certain places where certain parts where, where there was segregation. But she wouldn't perform there. Unfortunately, in April of 1926, Ms. Coleman, who had purchased a second airplane, took the plane up for a test, for a test flight. And in the course of testing that plane, it malfunctioned. And her mechanic lost control. It was an open cockpit. She fell out and fell to her death. But at her funeral in Chicago, 15,000 people showed up to pay their respect to her. Now, as often is the case, it is in death where we get the recognition which we deserve. And, and in Mrs. Coleman's case, it was no, no, no different. But in this case, a black real estate uh, uh, owner in Los Angeles created, uh, his name was w w William J. Powell, he created the uh, Bessie Coleman Aero Club. And the club was designed to specifically train African Americans how to fly. Now, the club is credited with inspiring directly and indirectly flyers like the five blackbirds, the flying hobos, in the Tuskegee Airmen. In 1931, 
the Pilots Association in Chicago began an annual flyover of uh, Lincoln Cemetery in Chicago to honor Ms. Coleman. In 1971, I'm sorry, in 1977, women pilots in Chicago established the Bessie Coleman Aviators Club. And in 1995, the US Postal Service put Ms. Coleman on a stamp. Now, I chose Ms. Coleman because she's an example of what happens when a dream is not deferred. Hopefully, telling her story will inspire others to pursue their dreams. And I will close with the words of a former First Lady, Michelle Obama. One of the lessons that I grew up with was that always, uh, one of the lessons that I grew up with was to always stay true to myself and never let whatever somebody says distract me from my goals. Congratulations on, on, on your Women's History Month and congratulations to the borough president. Thank you, Ron. Again, always, always a terrific, terrific partner. I'm going to deviate the program for a minute because when Ron started talking about first, it made me think. We have two judges here. Are you first, um, Sylvia Ash, Judge Ash, are you the first female judge to hold the position that you do? Are you? Yes, are you? So could you come and talk about that for a second? They need to know you are a living first. Come on. And Judge Heinz Raddick, you, are you also? Okay, so let them, just one minute, I'm sorry, but we have two firsts, other than the Brooklyn Borough President, we have, he's a male, but we love him. But we have two women who are first in their field. So they, they made history here in Brooklyn, so we can take a minute, so please, just a minute. Thank you, please. You can, one at a time, one at a time. I don't even know your title, but she, she Good evening. My name is Sylvia Hines Radix, and I'm an Associate Justice of the Appellate Division, Second Department, here in Brooklyn. <laughs> Tell what you do. I happen to have been born in Barbados, and so I am the first Caribbean person to have been appointed by the governor of the state of New York to sit on the appellate bench. Prior to my going to the appellate division, I was the administrative judge here in Brooklyn of the Supreme Court, Civil Court, and the lower Civil Court. And then I was the first woman to have had that new position that was created by the then Chief Judge, Jonathan Littman. But, wait a minute, so, excuse me, Judge, judge Hines Radix. Please explain to them your, du your duties, your roles, and your responsibilities, because they need to understand what you do. As I sit on the appellate division, I, um, we hear appeals, and we hear appeals from the lower uh, Supreme Court, from the Supreme Court, the matrimonial section, the surrogates court. Um, all of the judges, their decisions come to us, and we make a determination as to whether the judge should be affirmed or reversed. Um, the, Supreme, the appellate division happens to do not only uh, do that, we are, every attorney that is admitted in Brooklyn is admitted by the appellate division. We also, in addition to giving them their licenses, we are the people who also eventually, um, unfortunately, have to disbar them if they uh, do things that are improper. So um, the appellate division happens to be the second highest court in the state of New York. New York is different from other states in, to the extent that other states, the Supreme Court is the highest court. Uh, in the state of New York, the Court of Appeals happens to be the highest court. So it's the Court of Appeals, then the appellate division. There are four appellate divisions. Uh, the second department happens to be the largest appellate court, I would say, in the nation, because we do 51% uh, of the state of New York, uh, they work come to us. The other divisions uh, do whatever is left. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we constantly tell people that we are the hardest working judges um, on two feet. 
Nice talking to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. I am Sylvia Ash. Like Justice Radix, we're graduates from Howard University School of Law. Okay. HU. Okay. Um, speaking of first, I was the first, uh, I'm from the Caribbean, born in Trinidad, my mother from Grenada, my father from St. Vincent. Okay. I'm the first Caribbean woman to be elected in a countywide civil race in New York. I'm the first woman of color to be appointed as the presiding judge of the commercial division in Kings County Supreme Court. And um, I've been a judge for 12, 12 years, I think, <laughs> here in um, Kings Supreme. And um, as Judge Raddick stated, you know, after um, Supreme Court is the court below the appellate division. So technically, she reviews all of my decisions. So that's why I'm standing close to her. <laughs> okay. All right. No, no, no. She recused. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, being a judge of color, especially here in, um, in Kings County, is very important because we need diversity. And it's important to have judges of color coming from the communities so we understand when the litigants come before us, you know, we are, we live in the same community they live in. We um, identify with the issues that they are um, experiencing. And it makes it a little easier for us to understand their plight. And it makes it a little easier for them because when they're talking to us, they know that they're talking to someone who understands and who identifies where they're coming from and what they've been through. We have to apply the law you know, in every situation, regardless of who you are, where you come from. But there is, we have a little discretion in terms of, you know, there's such a thing as, you know, you, you have to look at the whole picture. Law is not just black and white. And that's why it's very important that everybody comes out and vote and you support your local electeds. And before I close, I just want to have my two colleagues come up here. Justice um, Janine Edwards, she does the matrimonial, no, excuse me, the med, med, medical malpractice in King Supreme. Say hello. So good evening, everyone, and happy Women's History Month. I am also Supreme Court Justice in, in, in the Supreme Court, along with my colleagues. Now, in terms of medical malpractice, I'm, I've just uh, been appointed as a medical malpractice uh, judge in Supreme Court. And so I, I hear all matter of cases involving any type of medical malpractice. If somebody believes something in it, you wasn't supposed to leave something in you. If um, a case that I recently had, it involved a, a, a person at a nursing home. He was given food when he wasn't supposed to get food, and so the nursing home was found liable. I do those types of, of cases. And here is Justice Waveney Toussaint. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Waveney Toussaint, and first, before I speak, let me say congratulations to all of this evening's honorees. You can hear from the lilt of my voice that I, too, am from the Caribbean. I am from the island of Trinidad and, uh, or, and Tobago, that is the nation. Uh, and I happen to be the first Trinidadian American to be elected to office in New York State, when in 2002, I was elected to the civil court of the city of New York. Uh, uh, I would like and also a Howard University Law School graduate <laughs> with my colleague. You know, being elected to office as a judge in civil court, uh, sometimes you are asked to sit in other courts. Civil court is the court where people can come uh, and bring claims for up to $25,000. However, some of the judges are asked to sit in our family courts and in our criminal courts. So what we do is important. So uh, I, right now, uh, I'm an elected Supreme Court judge, and I handle general civil matters where people can sue for billions of dollars if they wish. <laughs> I would like to leave this message with you. When there's an election coming up for judges, remember, get out there, see who's running, check them out, learn their history, because what we do as we sit on the bench affects 
each of your lives day to day. It makes a difference who your judges are. Know who you're putting in the position. And I want to thank all of my sisters who are judges. We love our judges. And I'm not going to prolong the program much longer, but a, a little birdie, one of our honorees, whispered to me that we have another female first in the house. So she knows who she is. So you might as well come on up. Come on up. <laughs> Police Officer Johnson. OK. I, I, Director, I don't know her capacity, but she's a first. So we're going to honor another first tonight. And then I want all of, I want all of our firsts, the two firsts, to take a picture with this one. And then all of our judges to take a picture with Ms. Johnson. That's good, right? Law enforcement and the judges. Oh, right. OK. Um, my name is Director Louise Kelly Johnson. I am the first female director of NYPD School Safety Division ever. I also happen to be a woman of color. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm here because one of my agents from Brooklyn North, Ms. Dowd, is receiving an award tonight, and I'm really, really proud of her. Um, but I am responsible for safety and security in New York City public schools. I have 5,000 agents and 1.1 million school children that I am responsible for. Please, let's watch out for our children. So, yes, our children. They're the one. And I want to thank, I want to ask our first, please, our two first, to please come forward and pose with School Safety Police Department first, NYPD Director, Director of Patrol Operations. And then I want our other judges to please join with them. I don't need to be in the picture. All right, I'll be in the picture. Please, we can give a round of applause to all of our ladies who were kind enough to sort of jump in. Tonight we do have a keynote speaker. If you open up your program, her bio is in the program. Her name is Warrant Officer One. That's her title, Warrant Officer One. Her name is Mary Masonette. Did I say it properly? She's part of All Source Intelligence Technician, 151 Theater Information Operations Group. And if you read your program, you will see her bio. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Warren Officer One, Mary Masonette, to please come forward and to bring greetings and to share remarks. Thank you. You can do better than that, come on now. Good evening. It is great to just hear these amazing stories from these women. It, it inspires you, and I hope that one day I can just work alongside many of you. I'm truly honored to be here tonight. I want to tell you a story about the lessons I've learned in the military and kind of how they apply to women's history and to my story as a woman. It was June 1st, 2010 when I arrived at basic training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. The first thing I thought was, who does this? <laughs> I was 23 at the time and had no idea what to expect. Basic training taught me not only how to do plenty of push-ups and run and sit-ups, because we did plenty, but I learned about the military culture. Along the way, I formed lifelong friendships. I was taught the seven army values. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage that I can truly say that all these women tonight and all women actually represent. So it's not just the army values, it's women's values. Yes. Above all though, I managed to build upon the foundation, my foundation as a woman. 
I learned more about who I wanted to be and who I wanted to be to contribute to society. Excuse me. I also learned from one of my drill sergeants, Sergeant First Class Jackson. Um, he told us something that would forever change my life. He said, you represent yourself. You represent yourself. While to many it sounds like a very singular statement, to me it encompasses so much more. It encompasses everyone and everything. It means I represent my past. Those women who came before me and men alike, who sacrificed their lives for others. Those who dared to stand up for what they believed in was right, and for those who did not have the voice to speak. It means it laid the foundation so that I, as a woman in the military, can stand in front of everyone here and wear the rank of Warrant Officer One. It means I represent my traditions, traditions of rice, beans, plantains, and plenty of good food. <laughs> My beliefs of, of kindness and service to others. My family and the best city ever, New York. Because trust me, everywhere I went, I told everyone, I am from New York and I am proud. You represent yourself, meant. I represent Latinas and all women who are currently serving in the military, who will aspire one day to be that next four-star general or that next uh, Chief Warrant Officer Five. And for those that don't know, those are very high-ranking women. It takes about a good 20 plus years to actually become that. Lastly, it means I represent the future. It means my actions will affect those I interact with. It will affect the future generation, my nieces, who require me to work hard, to lay the foundation so that her generation is better than my generation, that her generation doesn't experience anything that women this generation are, are experiencing right now. It means to work as hard as these women who we are honoring tonight because they truly deserve to be honored. Women who are giving back and improving their communities and helping that future generation flourish. If you take anything from my words tonight, I ask that you please remember that while we may be celebrating women's history, we are also celebrating the women's future and the endless possibilities for girls and women. We must do our part and ensure that we help our communities grow and that the act of caring for others does not require a uniform to be worn. So I wanna thank the Brooklyn Borough President for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight. I wanna to thank the team that put this lovely program together because I will be coming back next year and I will be bringing more people with me. I wanna thank everyone who has a program out there for their community. As a reservist, you don't understand how you'll impact your community. You're making it possible for reservists and National Guard members to live in their community and serve their country. You're making it easier so that way when I deploy or I have to be away from my family for a long time, I don't have to worry about my child in that community being harmed. You're making it easier for my future. So I truly thank you all for doing what you do. It's because, uh, sorry, I also want to thank my family because, you know, we have to thank our family. <laughs> my family, my sister, my niece, uh, my Fort Hamilton family is where I work. So if you're ever in Bay Ridge, please come to Fort Hamilton. And um, lastly, I want to thank everyone for not falling asleep while I was... <laughs> you know, speaking or snoring too loudly. <laughs> but with all my heart and sincerity, I do thank you all for what you do. And I encourage women that are either watching this or reading about this to learn more about their community, learn what they can do. You don't need a uniform to do something. You just need time and the ability to care for others. So thank you all and have a good night.
So ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure for me to introduce the president of our borough. Sometimes he wants an introduction, sometimes he doesn't. So I wasn't sure. So as we discussed tonight, you know, we have a number of firsts. We talked about firsts in terms of women. But tonight we will have to abridge that, amend it, because we have to talk about a first in terms of a black man, a man of African descent, who is our first Brooklyn Borough President. Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams. He broke, yes, please give him some love, yes. He distinguished himself in the New York City Police Department by achieving the rank of captain. During his tenure in the New York City Police Department, he was one of the organizers of an organization called 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care, an organization comprised of law enforcement personnel who looked within the department that they worked and discussed things that were being done which were unfair to individuals, not just blacks, but to all. After his tenure as a New York City police captain, he ascended to the role, to the ranks of New York State Senator of the 20th District. And I'm proud to say that I worked hand in hand with him to help him achieve that accomplishment. After seven years in the Senate, taking care of his constituents as if they were his babies. He used to tell me, those are my babies. <laughs> Sometimes you get a constituent that's a little, you know, testy. And he would say, don't you talk to my constituents if they're testy, I will handle them. Those are my babies. They elected me to serve them. And we would say, yes, Mr. Senator, those are your babies. He decided that he wanted to do something more. He wanted to serve all of the people in Brooklyn. He was born in, yeah, that's right, give him some love. He was born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens, but he knew that when it came down to taking care of business, he had to come back home. So he came home, he lived in Brooklyn for many years in the police department, New York State Senate. He worked tirelessly the same way all of the women at Brooklyn Barber Hall said, we work 24-7, our, our principal works 24-7, and then some if it's possible. He worked hard and long to achieve his goal to become our first African-American Brooklyn Borough President. So without any further ado, let's show some love for our Brooklyn Borough President, Eric L. Adams. Uh, 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 thank you so much. And you know, those of you, please, please have a seat. Those of you who are here in Borough Hall for the first time, um, or those of you who have been here before, you know the rule. Uh, you don't stand for me, I stand for you. I am, not, I am not elected to be served, I'm elected to serve. I spent 22 years of my life wearing a bulletproof vest protecting the children and families of this city, and I just changed the beat from the streets to Borough Hall. But my actions are the same. And I think too often people who go in government believe they should be deified, and they forget what is the true role to be a servant leader. You have to learn how to serve first to be a leader. I'll never forget going to a wedding once and sitting there for about an hour, and the bride and groom is there waiting, and the maid of honor, she comes popping in after getting her nails done and her hair done. She got it mixed up. She thought it was about her. You know, so I don't have it mixed up. It's not about me. It's about making sure that I leave a very rich and true legacy to deal with the issues that people are going through every day. And I can't do that if I'm primping and propping and thinking about how I am and not the people who interact with me. And, and it, it wasn't rooted in something that I've learned later in life. As we look at some of these great honorees and we're going to get the certificates uh, too, it was rooted in how I was raised. You know, I tell the story of the small storefront church, uh, Sister Daughtry, that I attended as a child. Uh, it was the church we used to call the Cheers Church. Everyone knew your name and everyone was glad you came. 
It wasn't one of these large mega churches you see T.D. Jakes and have. It was just a simple place. And we would have two services, one at night and one during the day. You go home and you eat during that in-between hours. And many days we had nothing to eat. It was six of us and my mother. Uh, and it was challenging, you know. And we had to make it happen somehow. And that's, you know, that small home that mama made for us. And so one evening when we came home from the day service, the evening service, a car caravan of women pulled up with groceries. And they carried it into our house one box at a time and prayed with us. And then when they left that night, about 2 in the morning, I went downstairs. And I'm going to say, man, we're going to finally have some real milk with our cornflakes and not that powder stuff. <laughs> you know? And I looked in the boxes, and the boxes were open. Half a box of spaghetti, half a box of a jar of mayonnaise, half a dozen of eggs. Those women could not afford to buy us groceries. They went into their own cupboards, took of half of what they had and brought it to Dorothy Adams and her children. That was the community I knew. So I can't identify with people that say that we are doing enough for people who are homeless. 20,000 babies are without homes, living in homeless shelters. I cannot comprehend that. When people say, you know, well, you know, we did our share. Christians don't do their share. And, and particularly those of us who are faith, if Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John was here today, they'd be out in the streets. They'd be doing real things and not being from a position of comfort and saying, how do we don't give back? People are hurting. And hurt people hurt people. They do hurtful things and they self-mutilate, not only by carving up their bodies, but by taking dr drugs and being in relationships where someone don't appreciate them and abuse them. 50% of the children who are on Rikers Island are dyslexic. Think about these numbers. Because they were sat in the classroom and instead of someone properly diagnosing them, they treated them like they were insignificant. Then they started hanging out on the corner. They started doing things that were inappropriate. And then they started finding groups who didn't judge them for who they were and allowed them to be part of them. And then they went to criminal behavior and they found themselves on Rikers Island. These are the pathways that we have to stop. And no one knows it better than the women. That's what these women history celebrations are about. All across history, if you go to India, when a man died back then, the woman had to throw herself on the fire. It was called Sita. There was no reason for her to live. When Japanese invaded China, they used to have comfort stations where they took all the Japanese women and made them the mothers and the housewives and made them go into prostitution to take care of the Japanese men. Right on the continent of Africa, they mutilate the vagina of women so they can't feel sexual pleasures because of the man's inability to control himself. Go through history. Culture by culture by culture, the only common denominator all over the globe is man's abuse of women. No other, nothing else is common. There's no other common denominator. The only thing we have in common, even when man on one side of the globe didn't know of man on the other side of the globe, they had a consistency on how they were going to abuse their, their women. Men in Europe used to go off to battles and make iron chastity belts, causing gangrene on the women just to try to control their behavior. Just a complete history of abuse. Complete history. And so we have these moments now where women are saying to themselves, we're fired up, we ain't going to take it no more. Fired up and we ain't gonna take it no more.
But my message to you is to be careful. Because there was a moment in Egypt that they realized very clearly that it was not about leading the women. It was about sitting side by side. You go and look at the different statues and artifacts and see how they worship and cherish their women. And the men of that time, those pharaohs, knew the importance of having a woman by his side. I'm part of the Men Who Get It Club. I'm clear. And in your battle to fight for what is right, don't lose those men who understand you have that right. That's why I have a lactation room in this building, the first lactation room open to a governmental um, office to let women know you have a safe space to nourish your baby. That's why we're pushing the agenda here that is a very woman-led agenda. And we're dealing with and dismantling those historical issues that made women ashamed for just being women. Why are we ashamed to talk about menopause? and what you're going through and what you're feeling. That is not a foreign entity. That's a natural transition in life. Why do we are afraid to talk about teaching our women menstrual cycles and, and talking, having real conversation? The reason we're so far back on these issues because we have taken the natural evolution and behavior of a family and a woman and we demonize it because the person who made it irregular was a bunch of people who never had a baby in their life, men. <laughs> Think about it. That's the freedom. The real freedom is saying to yourselves, I'm not going to allow you to take the natural beauty of my interactions and my existence and make it unnatural. We've made this stuff of families so unnatural. Right here, you know, nothing gives me greater joy than when I see my staff is bringing in their children and watching them roll around on the floor and play and, and talk loud and, and just enjoy themselves. And I have a model here in the building, family first. Family first. You deal with your family first because you cannot improve the lives of family members in this borough if you are worrying about your family members at home. You gotta deal with your family first. And so, we want to thank these honorees for what they have done, are doing, and will continue to do. And just, they're representatives of the, really the importance of the power of womanhood and the history of looking over and spending time in the month to just reflect on it giving us those moments where we say, how do we do better? How do we redefine and bring up the young girls who are trying and attempting to find their way in a very real way? And so this is our moment of saying thank you for what you do. And how do we continue to support you and give you the space and room to do the great things that you are doing? I'm happy the team that we have here uh, that took the time to look over all your bios and call you in and say, this is your day and our moment of saying thank you. Not only as Borough Hall, but as the Borough of Brooklyn, the third largest city in America. And everyone knows what I say, you know, two types of Americans, those who live in Brooklyn, those who wish they could. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Thank you for coming out and showing them the love, your family, your friends, everyone coming together and giving them their appreciation. So we want to give out these certificates at this time. <laughs> so I'm going to call the honoree, his name and Michelle, you're going to help me. Um, our first honoree this evening is Ms. Carolyn Gates Anderson. So Ms. Gates Anderson, would you please come forward?
After she gets her award, we'll ask Ms. Anderson to please say a few remarks. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so very much. I am really honored to be here. Thank you, President Eric Adams of the Borough of Brooklyn. Um, but what you said is really what it's all about. This award is really not about me. It's about all of my volunteers at Bloom Again Brooklyn uh, and all of the amazing community partners that we reach. We refurbish flowers we, that were destined uh, for the dump, and uh, we're kind of a city harvest for flowers. We take them, we refurbish them, we have 300 volunteers, and they represent really everybody in Brooklyn. We are young, we are old, we are black, we are white, we are every ethnicity, and we're really very proud to be here with you all. Uh, our, many of our community partners are here. Those flowers get refurbished. They go to people who normally do not get visits, flowers, uh, and arrangements. The, um, the, uh, our volunteers, upwards of 300, visit nursing home residents, domestic violence survivors, shelters, uh, and homebound seniors. And uh, we just want to say thank you so much. We're honored, but I'm really honored for my volunteers. Thank you so much. Our next honoree is Ms. Jacqueline Dowd. Oh, <laughs> and we know this honoree. Y'all wrong, it's two left shoes. <laughs> My name is Jacqueline Dow. I'm a school safety agent here in Brooklyn, and I work with children with disabilities. Very broad statement, but I love them all. I enjoy working with these children. They give me a sense of being, and I learn from them, and it's a sincere strength. I also have an adopted shelter. I adopt it for young mothers and their babies. I'm shutting the block down. Bedford Avenue, between St. John's and Lincoln, to raise money in awareness. Let's not just put them in shelters. Let them know that somebody out there cares for them. <laughs> I want to thank you for being here and my supporters. Have a good evening and get home safe. <laughs> Our next honoree is Ms. Lisa Molnar Giuliano. I'd like to say thank you for the privilege of being here today and receiving this award. I'm a little taken aback. I didn't know I was going to have to say anything, so I'm going to wing it a little bit. Um, I am a mathematics teacher at Bishop Carney High School in Brooklyn, and I've been there for 33 years. <laughs> and I would like to say that it's been a pleasure to interact and work with the girls, the fine young women that I've dealt with over, over these years. I consider it truly a privilege to be able to give back at a school where I received my own excellent high school education all those years ago. <laughs> and where the groundwork was laid for me to become self-aware of my place as a woman that can make a difference in the community. 
So I am very grateful to be there and to continue working with these, with these young women as they go forward and, and work on taking their place in the world as leaders of the world. Thank you. Our next honoree is Ms. Martha Camber. So I would like to thank um, everyone for this honor and I'd like to congratulate the amazing women um, who are being honored tonight. <laughs> Such a privilege to be a, a part of this group. Um, I'm the CEO and uh, president of the YWCA in Brooklyn. We are celebrating our 130th anniversary this year. And for those of you who don't know, we've kind of come back from the brink of bankruptcy, saved our building, and in a rapidly gentrifying borough, we built 300 units of housing for low-income and homeless women. Um, most, thank you. most of whom are uh, survivors of domestic violence, and our newest program is a college access and leadership program for over 300 girls of color in Brooklyn. So we're really excited. Um, we're really excited about our comeback, and it's great to be in the room with so many real Brooklynites because the borough's changing really quick, rapidly. There's just one thing I wanted to say also um, about um, our borough president, Eric L. Adams, and being um, someone who gets it. Many years ago, I was in an event, um, I'm telling your secrets, with um, Susan Taylor, who is the editor of Essence Magazine. And um, I, I re you revealed the fact that you read Essence magazine. So I suspect you had some older sisters who might have been responsible for the fact that you are such a progressive guy who gets it. So thank you so much for this honor. Thank you all. So now we have a group of honorees. And um, this evening, the president of the local 371. Two, 372 is present. I, you know, I keep telling the same thing and I have to get it straight. I have a really excellent relationship with Omar and with Michelle, um, 371 and 372. I love both of you equally and I do it all the time, so I beg your pardon. And I love Sean. So the president is here um, to partner with you, Borough President, because a number of his union members are being honored today. So. President Sean, would you please join President Adams? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the first honoree is Robin Chisholm. Is Robin here? Okay, well. Our second honoree is Miss Denise McLean. <laughs> Following Denise is Miss Lynette Murphy. Following Ms. Murphy, we have Ms. L Melissa Severe. <laughs> following Ms. Severe, we have Ms. Emma Jean Thomas. <laughs> and following Ms. Thomas, we have Ms. Barbara Richardson. <laughs> so we want to commend each and every one of you. And we want to thank you for all of the hard work that you do. After this picture, we want to invite, if you have family members or friends that want to take a picture, you know, come on up. And tonight, before we depart, after all of the honorees are presented with their citation, we will ask all of them to stay for a picture with the borough president. Family and friends, you will be invited at that time to join with them because we know you want to be in the picture as well as your keepsake. All righty. Good evening, everybody. This is a surprise for me as well. So, but they say if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready, right? So we stay ready here. But let me just say this to you. I am a proud president of Local 372. Yes, I am. 
And if you don't know that I know that 372 is made up mostly women. My union members are mostly women, so I don't want to say that's why the union is so great, but uh, I don't want to lie either. But I believe that's the one of the reasons why the union is so great. I mean, these ladies up here, they're awesome. They work with me every day, all day. They put up with my nonsense every day, all day. And um, it's amazing to know that women out here, because having a mother as a woman, having sisters and family like that, you'd be surprised the strong backbone women have. I know they say it's a man's world, right? They say that, right? Should we still say that? Yeah. Those, days go, those days, days are gone now? Yeah. You guys, you guys grew up, huh? <laughs> now, nah, but just real quick, I don't want to take too long, but I, I honor women, I honor you guys soulfully. My colleague, my, my, my members here, I mean, you guys are awesome. I love you guys to death. Thank you for work, the work you guys do every day, every day. And I appreciate you, you guys are well deserved. Every, all, the, all, all the other regions deserve, deserve it as well. Everybody else deserves the honor as well. But 372, we in the house? Yeah. 371, we love you too, baby. All right? Thank you so much. But let, let, let me just say this real quick. And I always said, I always bother the, 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 the borough president with this. He's always saying Brooklyn being the largest. So I'm from Queens, right? So this one, just, just for disclaimer purposes, yeah, they're the largest in population. But we got the, we, we, we the landmass. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Severe. I'm a local 372 member and, and also a Brooklynite. Sorry, Sean. <laughs> um, I'm so honored to be receiving this proclamation, this citation from the borough president's office. Thank you so much. Um, when I was asked to volunteer with my union, I couldn't turn it down. Uh, I didn't get an opportunity to volunteer during the Obama administration campaign, and that was like something that always made me kind of sad. But then I had the opportunity to volunteer with my union and, you know, continue with that struggle. So it, um, you know, has fulfilled a lot for me, um, you know, in that respect. I also want to say thank you to my daughter, who also went out with us volunteering. So we are training our future, you know, community organizers right there. My daughter, Avery. So thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Denise McLean, and I am overwhelmed to be here tonight. I am so honored, and I want to show my love. Yes. <laughs> and all I have to say is, as our previous president, who most of us love very much, Obama said, fired up. Fight up. Fight up. I love being a woman. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Lynette Queen Murphy, and I'm named after my grandmother, Queen Helen Murphy. I'd just like to say thank you to all of the honorees, and I'd like to thank the borough president for our just acknowledging us. And I wanted to just say thank you to my PS15 family that showed their love to come all the way over to support me, as well as my union, DC 37, 371, and 372. I just wanna say in this time and climate that we're in right now, as our president always says, if you stay ready, then you won't have to get ready. So we must stay ready because we don't know what gonna come up next. With number 45 in the office, we always have to be on our tip top toes. So no matter what happens, just know that we have one another. And just know that no matter what time it is, is our time. We are women, we are strong, we are here, and we're gonna make it. Thank you. Our final honoree for this evening is Ms. Jacqueline Gist Tillman. Good evening. My name is Jacqueline Gist Tillman. Um, I've been a school nurse for 21 years, District 75. I'm also a visiting nurse for 20 years, I just retired from Metropolitan Jewish Home Care. I wanna thank everybody for the nomination and all the lovely ladies up there. 
and also our borough president and my husband. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask all of the nominees to please, I mean all of the honorees to please step down so you can post for your photo. One of our honorees wanted to just make a special statement, please. I just like to give a special thank you to my lovely daughter who showed up, she took time out, rearranged her schedule to come over here to share in this experience with me. And I'd just like to say I love you so much. You are my future and I invest in you and I love you, thank you. And I wanna ask, I wanna please um, ask you all to please give a round of applause for our keynote speaker this evening, Warren Officer One, Mary Masonette. We didn't give her accolades appropriately, and I want to make sure that she is acknowledged. Please, all of the honorees, please move forward. So we can do the, the photo. I'm, I'm going to ask our sponsor to please join in with the photo, Mr. Ron Law.